All right. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kari Kwas, and I am uh, I work for the Snohomish Conservation District. And with me today is um, my colleague, Eric Shu. He's going to be our presenter today. Um, and then we are going to be talking about regenerative pasture management. I think he calls it something else. But in short, we're talking about how we can um, grow and use the soil, but then also put it back into the system. So Eric, you want to bounce ahead. So today, um, you already are all using the chat. That's great. Um, so I would, uh, oops, let me switch that. There we go. Um, keep putting your questions in there. I will catch them along the way. And then we'll certainly have time at the end for questions too. Uh, and also at the end, we'll be able to, if you want to raise your hand, then you can do that electronically, or I can look at the pictures and see you to ask Eric a question. Um, during the presentation, keep your lines muted and we are recording this class. Next slide. So what is a conservation district? Um, some of you already have probably seen this, but we are um, a sub-agent in the state, a special district. We both work for Snohomish Conservation District. And so our boundaries are Snohomish County and Camano Island. And we work with landowners and residents around the uh, county and area to protect natural resources and provide best practices um, tied to agriculture, residential, water quality, all kinds of different things. So this is really a part of our um, adult and youth education uh, to present at a conference like Country Living Expo. Normally we would have had a booth in the gym and we look forward to doing that next year. Next slide. A couple upcoming events. Um, one, first off, our plant sale is open and pre-orders will go until February 10th. And then we're doing pickup days on the 27th and 28th. This is uh, COVID related. So we just, um, we have you pre-order and then we'll have your plants ready and you just pick them up. Uh, next Wednesday at 7 p.m. on February 3rd, we'll have a discussion about climate change and how trees can help. And so we'd love for you to join us. It is going to be part information, but mostly discussion and then hearing from you about what you're doing on your property. So we hope you join you join us for that. I'll put these three links in the chat. And I think with that, um, we just want to definitely thank uh, WSU for hosting us today. And now without further ado, Eric. Hey, thanks for the introduction, Kari. And I assume everybody can hear me just fine out there. If you have any issues, you let me know, please. And yeah, I'm here today to talk to you about regenerative pasture management, restoring, renewing, rebounding your pastures to get to a place where oftentimes your livestock would rather be. And so with that, we're gonna look at, you know, what is, are we talking about complete renovation versus minimal renovation? What does that look like? How do we get there? And how do we maintain those new seedings through proper pasture management? Starting off, unfortunately, a lot of, a lot of times this is what people are familiar with and, and, and kind of see, you know, what we're looking at here in terms of just overgrazing. Some of the issues that I see with this field are, you know, we see three horses here, depending on how big this pasture may be, there may be more animals and so forth. But what we're really, what we see happening here is there's really a lack of forage being, um, being produced and that's mainly due to overstocking. Uh, with that, we have, uh, the grass takes a hit, it's not as healthy as it could be. And with year round use, especially like on a day like today, when it's pouring down rain and if your animals have access to those fields, it, it really is detrimental to your soils. It's detrimental to the vigor uh, and the ability for the grass to grow properly like it should come this spring. Um, and it also opens up the opportunity, as you can see here, for, for weeds to come in and, and take over. A lot of times we'll have, like in this picture, you can see tansy ragwort, which is the, the yellow flower here. And is my pointer visible? Yes, Sorry. it is, okay. Eric. Yep. Okay, wonderful. And this is curly doc. Um, and it's, you know, curly docs, yeah, I don't believe it's an oxygen sweet, but tansy certainly is. And this is a better view of what that plant looks like. And it's tansy basically starts out as a rosette the first year. 
And if you see a plant like this, typically along fence lines and or dispersed out in the middle of your pastures, it's a good idea to get out there with a shovel and just dig it out by the root. Best thing you can do is throw it in your trash bag and, and let it go to the landfill. You can use herbicides on this. Uh, I believe you'd have to use a uh, broadleaf spectrum selective herbicide to control this weed. Um, I'm not going to get too far uh, into that here today, but um, also want to mention with if you have tansy out in your field and it's 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 elongated, it's flowering, it's going to seed. It's it's a good idea to clip that off and and bag it and throw it in the trash as well, just to get rid of it. So here's another shot of a, a well-used area. This is typically, as you can see, this is around a feeder. And this, this area is just, it's been, you know, overused. The soils are compacted. We have what it looks like to me is burdock coming in and taking over. And I wanna add one thing. At the district, we work with folks. Um, one of our main goals is to help improve water quality. And, you know, pasture management and runoff and so forth, they really do go kind of hand in hand. And with this shot here, it, you know, the photo looks like maybe this field's on a, a bit of a slope. Um, and a lot of the bare areas and piles of manure that you see around there really can contribute to uh, fecal counts in our waterways and nutrient and sediment loads as well. So it's just not uh, a good thing for fish or recreation or drinking water as well. So I think this probably, this makes us all feel a little bit better. This is where we'd like to be. This is a quite a happy horse. Um, I know growing up we had horses and, and we always kind of had to watch uh, Foundry and we certainly wouldn't want to let this horse be out here all the time, you know, eating as much as it wanted to, wants to. Uh, horses tend to get a little heavy, but the pasture looks fantastic. And uh, uh, towards the end of this presentation, I'll, I'll illustrate a little bit more of where this pasture started from and kind of the steps that the landowner took to get to this point. And it might be a little bit surprising, but um, so yeah, so we're, um, yeah, this is what we're trying to get to obviously. So in terms of renovation, what are we talking about here? So if you get to the point where you feel like you need to renovate and it's basically the complete destruction of all plants, everything that you have out there and trying to reestablish a pasture through new seeding. And you, you get to that point if you really have, you know, 40% or less of the grass growing. And that's when you may want to consider this. Um, the one thing that you want to do is just ask a few questions ahead of time. Work with your local conservation district or WSU um, or your local feed supply store. They have reps on hand. A lot of times that can help guide you through managing your pastures a little bit better. But I know for me and the work that I've done, things to, to think about is one, you know, management is key. And have you thought about, well, what can I possibly change to maybe, you know, get away from this moonscape and weeds and more to a lush pasture situation? Ask questions like, are you overstocked? Uh, have you soil tested? And have you had those results analyzed by somebody who could say, yeah, you know what, your soils are a little bit acidic here or they're low in nutrients. And maybe if you did this, this, and this, that would bring your fields back before you go down the path of total renovation. Total renovation is kind of your last resort most times. And the other question though too is, is you know, going down the path of, of management. I think management is roughly 90% of the, of the game here. And if you're willing to adapt and change your management style to the fact of maybe you know, using a heavy use area, um, add rotational grazing program or cross fencing and so forth. Because you have to keep in mind, most times the reason that the pasture is the way it is, it's because you kind of allowed it to be that way. And unless you change what you're doing and you know, if you go ahead and just spend all this money reseeding and so forth, it's just gonna revert back. And that can just be you know, money wasted and frustrating and so forth. So with that, going back to your soils, looking at, you know, one, take a soil sample and, and trying to figure out what you have in terms of nutrients, your organic matter, 
and your pH. pH is really key in this neck of the woods, um, as a, you know, probably all neck of the woods actually, but pH here tends to run, our soils tend to run a little acidic and grass likes a more neutral pH. So that means at least six and a half to seven, that's where grass really thrives the best. And if you can manage your soils to be at that level, it's gonna, you're really managing towards your grass and not so much as those unruly weeds that are, are trying to take over. And usually with, with that, you know, so talking about pH, how do you alter the pH? Well, that's by applying lime. And that can be either dolomitic lime or egg lime or pelletized lime. Both of those dolomitic and, and egg lime, I'm sure you can get them both pelletized. Um, the one thing with dolomitic lime, it has magnesium in it. And if you see in your results from your soil test that you need magnesium, then that's a good way to go ahead and add that at the time of lime application. When you're, you know, if you're gonna do a, a complete pasture renovation, or if you're just gonna take some steps to maybe do some mineral renovation to your fields, that's, that's a good time to, to look at maybe if you need to apply nutrients or apply lime at that time before you start doing any earthwork or, or cultivation, so to speak. The other thing about your soil is to know your soil. Um, I wish I had, I, I should have put the uh, web soil survey address up here. Uh, maybe Kari can add it to the chat somehow. Um, if you look up NRCS web soil survey, you can send it out to folks. I can do it's, that. It's a great, great resource to, you can go to a map and you, you pinpoint your location and then you can find out all kinds of information about your soil type. And that's really key in the sense of knowing, you know, what's a good time of the year to maybe recommend uh, a new seeding at your place. You know, you have to think about, are the soils tend to be a little bit droughty? Are they, um, you know, have good, um, are they, you know, located in the bottom land, pretty wet and so forth? You know, they're prone to um, frost heaving, that, that sort of thing. Uh, those are all factors that really kind of play into the timing of when you want to reseed um, your fields. There's a question, Eric, that I think is still pretty timely. Um, sure. When you add lime, is it topical or do you mix it in mechanically? So you can do it both ways. So generally speaking, lime um, is a topical application for sure. And if you're going to renovate your fields, then you would be incorporating that into the soil uh, at that time. If you have, you know, a pretty decent stand of grass in your pasture and you don't want to incorporate everything in, you can go ahead and apply lime in early spring. I tend to, I would actually recommend doing that in the fall and letting that wash in over the winter and it'll, it'll eventually get there and, and wash into the root zone and benefit your grass that way too. Yeah. So species selection. I want to take a step back here just for a moment and remember one of the handouts is this extension bulletin 1870. This is one of the handouts that goes with this class and the presentation. Um, this is this handout's been around for a while, but it's a great resource. Steve Franson and Martin Cheney, they are kind of our, our pasture and hayland experts in our area. Uh, Steve works for WSU, Martin Cheney works for the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is the brand, a branch of the USDA. And they put this information together. And you know, a lot of this talk and information that I'm giving you today is based out of this handout. So please print it off and, and give it a good read. It's, it's well worthwhile. And also I want to add to the presentation that you that is noted as well, or in the, you know, oh, listed for you to go ahead and download and view. Sorry about that. It's, I was sent that out a couple of weeks ago. So the one I'm going through today is just slightly different. I've added slides, I've added a few things here and put them in different order. So I apologize if you're trying to follow along and it seems a little wonky that way, but uh, yeah, it should, it should work for you. So anyway, with, with species selection, it's critical to figure out, okay, one, what am I trying to do? Am I trying to just raise, make hay? Am I wanting to graze in hay or, or you know, exactly um, you know, what that path looks like for you. And then also, come, you know, correlate that with your soil type, uh, you know, in terms of like how, how wet it is, how dry your soils might be. And that's where table one in this handout really helps you, helps guide you towards, hey, 
tall fescue and a legume of some sort would work really well for my location. I'm gonna go with that mix and, uh, and go from there. So again, let's put the handout and uh, if you can please reference that when you get time. And Eric, I put both your slides and that handout in the chat. Oh, okay, great. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Um, so there's so another thing to think about too is like multiple species versus single species mix. There's nothing wrong with going to your, your farm supply store and just getting a bag of this good old farm five star, six star blend. Um, you know, two to three of those varieties are gonna they're most likely grow well for your location, but it's harder to manage that mix in terms of palatability of what your livestock are going to want to graze on. So, you know, you're going to get real uneven grazing that way. So they're going to, they're going to want to eat in their, you know, orchard grass is kind of the ice cream for most livestock, especially for horses. Um, you know, so if you just have mainly tall fescue, perennial rye, and maybe a little bit of orchard grass, it may not be quite as well in uh, suited for your, for your horses. But um, so anyway, what I'm getting at is that it may be easier and beneficial to just go with a single grass species uh, variety and and combine that with a legume um, such as maybe triticale or, or clover or whatever is best suited for your livestock type. It's a little easier to manage and it's easier in terms of for grazing and for making hay and so forth. And um, when it comes time to rotate your animals in a, in a rotational grazing period, it's easier to make that choice and that decision by just saying, hey, they've They've grazed everything down to about three inches, and it's time to move. Them. We'll go into that here in a little bit. But I want to talk about buying seed. So when you go to the farm supply store, I would say you know nine times out of ten you're going to get a good quality product. But it's important to know that you you really want to spend your dollars on buying the pure seed that you can afford. And on the tag, the seed tag, you have information on there that talks about germination and purity, any noxious or obnoxious weeds that are that may be in the mix. And you know, it's kind of a buyer beware type of situation. So you want to make sure that you know what you're buying and you know that what you're buying is going to work for you. So germination, and so if it's a 98% germ, that, that's just basically saying that 98% of, of these seeds in this bag are um, until they should germinate and grow and so forth, and same with the amount of um, inert material in terms of purity. My next slide goes into a seed tag, and is that, can people see that okay? Is it is it legible or is it too small? It's pretty good. I mean, it's small, it's, it's but okay. it's still pretty good, and people can change their view to be full screen as well. Okay. So I just want to, you know, this is some of the information that, that you'll find on the tag. You know, you've got your germination rate. You have the variety and kind of seed that you're buying. How much pure seed is out there by varietal mix? Any other crop seed that might be in there? And it matter. I thought it was interesting. This tag is going with a, um, a mix of all kinds of different grass seed uh, species, but it has 89.9% inert matter. So there must be some mulch or fertilizer added in with it. Um, so, you know, keep in mind, if you're just trying to buy seed, make sure you're just buying seed, not the, the mulch, and maybe you didn't want to. Uh, again, noxious weeds. Uh, this one is none found per pound, and that's exactly what you want. So, test date, sell by date, has an expiration date for grass seed, uh, any kind of vegetable seeds for that matter too. So, something to, to look at and consider when, when purchasing seed. So we're going to transition and talking a little bit about, you know, or going into renovating your, your pastures or your field. This could be a good, this is a good time to, to maybe ask a question or two if people have one or, or I don't know if there's any in the chat box. None right now, but maybe Eric, if you look, I put the web soil survey um, from the USDA. Is that the NRCS one? Yeah. Okay. So I got yeah, that for, right. Yeah. Okay. Great. So talking about minimal renovation for your field, if you have a grass field, much like the photo in the top right, what this person is doing is they're taking a pasture harrow. And, and this, so these three photos kind of illustrate different pasture harrows that you can utilize on your, on your farm. And you're basically 
dragging the grass, you're scratching the soil, you're scratching the roots, and which in, in the spring, usually you do this in the spring, it helps promote growth. And, you know, what this, what you're wanting to do here is, you know, run the harrow through, and then you, if you want to establish a new seeding by, um, with your new mix and so forth, go ahead and, and overseed heavy with like at least 30 pounds of seed to the acre after you've done run the harrow through and then broadcast your seed and then run the harrow back through again and make sure that that seed gets buried down, has uh, contact with the soil. If you have seed out there that's just laying on top of your grass, it's not gonna do anything. It may germinate, but as soon as it tries to throw its little root down and it's not in contact with the soil, it's just, it could very well dry out in a hurry and die and so forth. Um, so that's, that's gonna be key. And, um, you know, again, these are just some ex different examples of um, pasture harrows that are out there that you, can, that you can find. And I'm sure most of you are aware of, you can find them at your farm supply store. You can probably find them at your, your local equipment dealer, you know, whether it's uh, International, Pace, Pace International, John Deere, or Kubota or whatever, but um, just wanted to throw those up. So, the other option is a little bit more affordable approach and you know the the pasture harrow on the top left that's one way you can go like i mentioned earlier you can buy that at your farm supply store but you can also utilize this is a piece of chain chain link fence and it looks like a gate somebody is added a little bit of weight to it the cinder block and they're pulling up behind their four-wheeler and you know it's going to do much the same as those other expensive, uh, fancier versions of a pasture harrow. I'd say it's not gonna get down and maybe scratch quite as well as the other ones do, but it still will be able to, you know, break up the road apples or other manure piles in your field. It'll still be able to get that, help get that seed in contact with the soil um, at time of reseeding. This is an example of how you can do a broadcast seeding with this minimal renovation approach. And this is just a your basic cone spreader. It's a it's ground driven, you tow behind your four-wheeler or riding lawnmower, whatever, what do you whatever you have available. We do have one of these at the district that we can um, loan out to folks to use. And it's great. It's it's multi-purpose. You can spread grass seed with it. You can spread fertilizer if you're wanting to spread like either an organic or conventional commercial fertilizer based on your soil test results. Um, you can also apply the lime with it as well. And I can attest through personal experience that putting lime in one of these things, and if you're using like egg flour lime, you, you can come out looking, you know, a little bit, you know, dusted, so to speak. You know, you have lime all over you, or most of the lime that you're applying blows over to your neighbor's field instead, and they get the benefit from it. So what I would recommend is try to either one, do it on a, on a calm day, or two, spend a little bit extra money and buy your lime pelletized. It's, uh, it's a lot easier to handle. It's a lot easier to get out where you want it to be. Um, it takes a little bit longer to react in your soils and wash in, but it's, it's really pretty minuscule. So One other thing to think about with your soils, and I and I going back to that first slide that I put up with the horses and the weeds coming on, and and it looked like a golf course out there. The grass was so short. Chances are, those soils are really compacted, and one of the reasons why that grass is probably not grown very well is because there's year-round use out there. The livestock have access like on a day like today or throughout the winter time. And that really puts a lot of pressure on your soils. It's gonna compact that, you know, top three, six, eight inches. And what you're losing is pore space and the ability for roots to penetrate and grow and, and utilize the moisture and nutrients that are there in the soil profile. So one way to alleviate that without doing a total renovation is to use an aerator. And I imagine most of you are familiar with this concept. People do it in their, in their lawns too. Um, but these are just some examples of ones, the bottom right is more of a commercial larger scale sized uh, aerator. And then the top left is one that's a little bit smaller. I've seen them, you know, you can buy them at Home Depot, that kind of thing. If you've got a real small area that you're trying to manage, um, 
it works well. It does it does a, a nice job of just breaking up that compacted layer and allowing some pore space to, to get in there and water to infiltrate as well. Uh, Eric, there's a question about um, the aerating. Um, mm -hmm. Can you can a harrow be used to aerate? I'd say the harrow, if depending on the type of harrow that you're using, and some harrows you can adjust so that the spike teeth are at a different angle, and so they'll they'll dig in and scratch a little deeper into your into your ground. That's kind of a way to, to aerate a little bit. It's just, it's not gonna do quite the trick as what we saw with the, the previous equipment up here. Cause it's, you can see how this, this top aer aerator is really getting down there and, and, and popping a plug out as you move along. The pasture hero is not gonna get, do quite that much. And then follow up to that from Ruth, how often would you aerate? Once a season, more? Yeah, I think, you know, you're just going to have to um, kind of see how things are going. If, if your grass is growing very well and, um, you know, if, if, yeah, I would say it's really determinant upon your yield and how things are uh, looking out there. If things were short, if you walk out there, you, you can feel the ground is hard and that kind of a thing, then you may want to aerate, you know, going into fall and again, coming out of spring, you know, just to try to break that up a little bit on an annual basis. Okay, and then another question, um, would mm -hmm. using a subsoiler be too invasive? Um, if you're wanting to just do minimal renovation, yeah, I'd say that'd be too invasive because it's gonna really lift up and break up that, that soil profile quite a bit and you're gonna be left with a pretty rough surface. Um, subsoiling is something more for a total renovation type of approach, yeah. Very good. There's one more question about wild horses and where they range in Eastern Washington. And I don't know if you know that or if I, if Michael would be a better. Where they, where they range? Yeah. Gosh, Michael would be better to answer that one. I, all I know is I've heard of Horse Heaven Hills, which is, mm -hmm. I don't think there's any horses up there. It's mainly farmland. And then there's the area around Vantage with the, the horse, wild horse monument. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's okay, about as, um, so yeah. Joe, I will, I will get you Michael's contact information. All right, that's it for now. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, thanks. So if we decide to go down the approach of total renovation of your, your pastures, so that's basically, you're going in and if you want to use chemicals, you, um, you, know, you want to kill everything down and then let that sit and then come in with your mechanical tillage afterwards to turn, turn your soil over and start anew, right? Um, you can also do it without chemicals, obviously, uh, or of course, you know, you can, um, it's, just, it's just personal preference. And I would say that if you have a lot of weeds out there and it's really troublesome to you, uh, and if you're okay with using an herbicide, then that may be the approach that you wanna do. Within the extension bulletin handout that I have, there's a whole bunch of different scenarios in here, renovating using minimal herbicides uh, for fields with severe weed problems, uh, herbicide, using herbicides um, uh, with tillage or, and so forth, the renovation with minimal equipment or herbicides. So go ahead and take time to read into that and see which, which situation might work best for you. Um, the one, one good thing to think about. So if you're going to if you're going to do a total renovation from grass to grass, you know you're going to have a pretty good net root zone and the plant material that you're turning over. You want to like do that process and let it kind of bake in a sense. Have it let it break down, compost a little bit, and give it about four weeks or so just for that um, vegetative material to break down before you um, try to reseed. Um, that's also a time, and going back to the other question, aeration versus subsoiling. So if you know that you have a compacted root zone, um, and if you have access to a subsoiler, a lot of people don't, uh, but if you do, that would be a good time to go ahead and do that. But you wanna also keep in mind, like, gosh, what do, you know, what's, what's how deep am I gonna go and how, what's lying beneath the surface. A lot of these fields that we have may have pre-existing drain tiles in them and you'd hate to run out there and, and damage, do any damage to those. Those would be beneficial to you. And then of course, any kind of utilities as well. So you wanna, you know, if you're unsure, 
811. 811 is your number, kind of a call before you dig, so to speak. So another thing too, for before I get too far along here, I want to I just I want to mention like if you're you knowing your soils, like we mentioned before. So if you have more of an upland soil or like your alder root or your topal soils, <clears throat> excuse me, your topal soils that may have quite a few rocks in them or they, they have in a prior existing hard pan, total renovation may not be the best answer. And main reason is if you have a lot of rocks, it's going to be hard on your equipment. And once you disturb or break that surface, it's kind of funny. You start farming rocks. They kind of find their way to the surface. Then the next thing you know, you're picking rocks all the time. Um, and that's where, you know, it may be helpful to work with your local conservation district and, and one of the farm planners there to kind of evaluate your site just to make sure that's really the best uh, approach for you. Um, so anyway. Hey, Eric, what, yeah. how would you define a subsoiler? What is it? So, so I, I should have included a, a photo of one. I don't have a, a subsoiler here. Typically for a smaller scale, uh, they're like, it's like a big, it's a three shank um, implement that you attach to the back of your tractor. And it's, it just goes down and it's these knives that go down and, and about anywhere from 18 to maybe 24 inches that you drag behind and it just breaks up that compacted layer. I'd, I'd say right now the easiest way to, to look up one is Google subsoiler and it should show you a, a good image of one. Yeah, I'll, I'll put that in my Google search in the chat. I can see what you mean. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Kari. Yeah, you're welcome. So with uh, complete renovation, so it's a good idea to think about one, you don't want to renovate all of your land at once. And main reason is you probably have horses or other livestock there that still need to graze and be out on pasture. So you need to maybe just do a chunk of it. And, you know, usually it's the 20% rule we talk about that you want to try to accomplish, you know, at one time. And, you know, there's, there's other things, other things, or excuse me, other things that factor in here is that, you know, your reseeding may not go very well. Uh, maybe you'll get a real droughty summer and your new seeding just can't quite get off the ground or you have winter flooding because you reseeded in the fall and you have all this water that came and killed your new seeding. They would be really unfortunate to have that happen to all of your pasture. So just something to keep in mind. So this is an example of somebody going out and just using a three-point attachment um, disc for their field work and they're just going through and, and working in there. Looks like a small section uh, that they're going to try to get some new pasture growing. I like, excuse me. One thing I would I would note here is one they haven't used an herbicide ahead of time, and so they're going to they're just going to disc it in as uh, you know kind of green mulch so, so to speak, and that's nothing wrong with that. It's a good way to go. Um, if you were to go in here and and apply an herbicide beforehand, you want to give the the plants time to die. You let it turn yellow and brown, and let those plants um, you know kick the bucket, so to speak. If you don't, there's a good chance that those plants, you know, they need to photosynthesize to get the chemical all the way through their system in order to perish. And if you don't allow that to happen, there's a chance that if you turn them over that they may survive and then reseed or regrow, and which is, you know, really defeating the purpose of what you're trying to do there, so. This just a couple more photos of, um, uh, disking and this person up here is just taking his disc and, and going right into his, his field and turning things over breaking it down um, bottom right is a really dry situation and it's just a it's a good way to get in there and break up that crust layer and try to to get a good seed uh, seed bed prep for your new for your new grass seeding and I'm sure all of you are familiar with the moldboard plow. This is just an example. This particular situation, they're going right in and they're just, they're jumping right into the sod and they're plowing it right over. There's actually still some snow on the ground. It's like it's taken in, I don't know, Eastern Washington somewhere. Um, I wouldn't do it that way. I would actually go in with the disc first and let it kind of, the grass break down a little bit and then plow. I think it just makes it, it's a little bit easier process um, for the, for one, for, the organic matter to break down and also easier for your equipment as well. 
Um, another approach is to use a rototiller. Rototillers are really good at uh, chewing things up. Um, in this situation, you have basically bare dirt and it looks like it was growing corn last season, kind of a deal. And it's good at, at rotivating and, and turning that uh, top, you know, four to six inches up and prepping your seed bed, which is, you know, seed bed prep is critical in the sense of you don't want it too, too fluffy, you don't want it too hard, um, you don't want it too, um, you know, full of dirt clods as well. And the, and the main reason is you're just trying to make a nice, even um, seed bed for your, for your grass seed to go into. And I'll, and I'll show you here in the next slide. One thing you can do <clears throat> is you can use a, uh, a roller or cultivator packer. This is a really small scale one. But, you know, through um, field work and turning your soil over and so forth, you're going to end up really fluffing things up, right? And so if you have, a, if you go out there after you just rototilled everything up um, and the ground's pretty loose and, and um, you know, fluffy, you, you basically run the risk, if you throw your seed out all over the top of that and then just kind of like maybe harrow it in, you really run the risk of those seeds drying out if they germinate, um, it's good that you could have a real lack of moisture there. Same with if you have too many dirt clods and it's just the, it's just too bulky and and so forth that the water holding capacity just isn't where it should be to help support those seeds after they germinate and want to um, you know grow into your new seeding. So it's good to to go in and um, pack things down with a with a roller if you have access to one. You can also use your pasture harrow and run that through maybe several times until you when you get off the tractor. And you step down into your field and it just feels like you know hey this is pretty firm you know my i'm making footprints that are half inch quarter inch or so it's okay to go ahead and broadcast your seed out and then follow it up and harrow it in as well with your pasture harrow you want to avoid leaving your seed just on top of the soil surface because one it just it just it needs to be you know, covered by you know at least a quarter inch of soil just to do the best it can. And otherwise, it's prone to make it blow away in the wind. It could uh, wash away as well. So, um, and that goes into this next slide here, where you know the difference of what I'm trying to illustrate is you know this is a an area where it was compacted. It's hard, and if you just broadcast your seed there and expect it to grow, it's there's a good chance it could wash away with a with a um, you know, next rainfall is going to come. It's it makes it harder for the grass seed to germinate and actually penetrate into the ground and get and get the roots down where it needs to be, versus this other area that's been worked. You know, it just um, that's got all kinds of nooks and crannies for that grass seed to fall into and thrive. And and just one pass with your harrow is going to cover most of it up, and and you should be good to go. So Eric, to mm -hmm. that um, question is what is harrowing, putting soil on top or turning the top of the soil? Well, harrowing is basically um, taking the pasture harrow like I, I showed earlier that you're dragging through your grass field. We can use the same, the same harrow to go over the soil surface as well and to work that, that ground down, compact it a little bit or use to um, just get your grass feed covered up lightly as well. Okay. This just illustrates a little bit further in terms of um, proper soil preparation. And if you, as you can see here, you've, um, you have good soil aggregation on the left and there's a lot of room for the, the roots to grow. There's pore space um, before, before it gets down into the more kind of blocky, um, harder areas. but you know, your, your grass plants are, are just going to do a whole lot better here versus on the right where, you know, it's, it's basically you just have a surface crust and it's very indicative of, you know, this area, right? That's kind of what we're, we're seeing the difference of here and here. And, you know, you're just, your grass, sorry, I keep repeating myself, but it's just not going to do as well. So um, you need to get in there and, and break that up as, as much as you can. It's also good if you have um, a good aggregated soil, you're gonna have better infiltration of water. 
when it rains, the water's going to be able to make it where it needs to be to help support the growth of those plants versus a hard compacted soil on the right. That water's going to have a tendency to want to just run off and, and run down slope and, and carry some prized soil and other stuff with it. So that's uh, another good reason to make a, a nice good seed bed. Um, <laughs> Pardon me. Yeah. Um, we were uh, joking on the chat, and I think the answer is yes, but that harrow is both a noun and a verb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. All right. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So thank you for that. Seeding depth is critical. You, you really don't want to bury these seeds too deep. And you know, think of like, you know, if you're a gardener, you're going out there and you're planting your lettuce seed out there, you read the back of the packet like I do, I'm like, oh yeah, so a quarter inch deep, don't go any further. Because those, those little seeds only have so much energy to, to, to poke out of there and, and get growing. So uh, if in doubt, seeds shallow, and but also make sure your seed is in contact with the soil. Um, I wanna also kind of emphasize that if you have the ability to you know, pack that soil down a little bit with cultivator and so forth. During dry times of the year, it's going to help wick moisture up from the subsurface up to the root zone. Uh, I've seen it time and time again in different situations with row crops or uh, other seedings as well. That 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 compacted, not too much, but that compacted area really there really promotes moisture to come to the surface. So something to think about. Here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch a little bit on the concept of no-till seeding. And this is a, it's a great way to go in the sense that it's less disturbance to the soil, uh, except for right where you want the seed to be. Um, it's less passes. It's a kind of a, you know, you put your seed in. I think you can also incorporate a fertilizer, granular fertilizer there in there if you want to. A lot of different seed sizes and multi uh, seed mixes you can apply at the same time, all in one pass. I know a lot of our larger commercial dairy farms will use this in areas of their grass fields that have drowned out over the winter, and they just they get their big no-till drill out and they just go through and reseed these areas in that manner. This is something that we've at the district we've toyed around with the idea of getting one of these to loan out to people so they can use them on their pastures, but. It's one, they're expensive. This unit is about $30,000. Um, you gotta, you gotta know what you're doing to use it. And they're, they're kind of high maintenance. You, you'd, you'd be in trouble if you had this thing on the ground and you turned a corner, it doesn't like that. And it's sometimes hard for people to remember to, to pick them up and so forth. But the benefit of no-till, uh, no you know, you, you stand the chance of less erosion if you're on some sloped areas. Um, you have improved water conservation, uh, lower uh, labor costs, reduced fuel costs, and so forth. So it's um, also a nice nice approach for improving organic matter in, in your soil as well. So. There's a comment in the chat that um, Eric's extension, Lewis County, has a couple of loaners of those. Did really? Oh, OK. A 40 horsepower tractor to pull. That's the minimum. Yeah, yeah, then, and usually you have to have hydraulic ports as well. Uh, a lot of people don't have that option on their tractor, so you, you, you do have to have the horsepower and the, and the right connections to make them work at times. But, but yeah, I know King, King Conservation District has one as well, and San Juan Conservation District has one, and so yeah, so it's, we may get there, we're just a little bit unsure at this time. Cool. So, um, wanted to touch on too, weed control after planting. So. We have, um, you know, those darn weeds, they're always going to be there. And they're in the extension bulletin that talks about different approaches to uh, in, you know, heavy infestations of weeds and or moderate and so forth and different different methods of reseeding your fields uh, based on that. Um, I'm not going to get down, dive down too deep here, but, you know, typically one, uh, an easy way to, to handle your new seeding is to control weed pressure by mowing uh, or by use of a uh, selective herbicide, such as a 2,4-D type, type herbicide uh, to control those broadleaf weeds. Um, mowing is also very successful and 
you know, as your grass seeding seedlings grow and, and come out of the ground, you know, if they're two, three inches tall, they usually grow slower than our annual weeds do. And you can come in there and you can, you can clip those weeds down while not clipping your grass seed, your new seeding grass seed down. Um, and it can be pretty effective at controlling um, a lot of those weeds that are, that are coming on. I want to illustrate here that this is, you know, a new seeding of grass coming on. And I wanted to just, I threw it in here because it's interesting in the fact that it shows the relation of the leaf area on top versus the roots down below. They're about the same, right? And this is kind of your savings account, uh, money in the bank, so to speak. And this is your, your cash up here. And you don't want to keep drawing from your savings to keep the cash flow going too much or else you're going to start um, affecting your root zone in the sense where it, the roots will get shorter and your grass will not be able to rebound quite as well. We'll get into that a little bit more here coming up. Eric, Before, a quick question. Um, yep. so I want to make sure I get the right answer. We do, we do not have an aerator for rent at the district. We just we have do. the spreader and the manure spreader. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks. So you've gone ahead and you've reseeded an area of your pastures and the grass is growing. You're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to get my, my sheep out there or my horses out there tomorrow. I, I, I'm tired of buying hay and I'm going to throw them out there. Well, one thing you want to do is, is to give the grass the pull test. And if you can grab that grass and pull it and it breaks off, the leaves, just the leaves break off, then you're probably ready for some light to moderate grazing. But if you pull and the roots come out with it, then you have to wait. Otherwise, those those animals are going to go out there and they're going to be pulling their ass out all over the place. Um, and this in this picture, I got to say the grass is taller than the weeds are. So, but the weeds are coming, and you may um, in this situation want to do a mowing um, here shortly. So, so just uh, yeah. So just I just spoke about this. Um, you know, usually you, if you, before you can get out on your new seating after you pass the full test, it's about 90 days of light grazing following, following afterward. Um, so really, if you think about it, so if you do a new seating in the spring and it's April, and you really only have light grazing available after you get past the full test, um, it takes about one full season to really get your new field established before you can really um, start utilizing it. So. Something to, something to think about and consider. I threw this in, this is just basically, you know, in terms of uh, grazing and pasture management, we want to uh, stop grazing when everything is down to about three inches. And then once everything regrows up to six to eight inches, that's when it's time to go ahead and go back out there and uh, let your animals uh, have at it. So this illustration is basically just again, talk about that savings account down here. And when you allow too much grazing, it, it's going to increase your rebound time. And you're going to spend, excuse me, le uh, less time out on pasture overall if you just go ahead and leave a little bit of your leaf area there and don't graze it down too short. And again, it's because the roots mimic the leaf, leaves on top. And so if you don't have that root structure that's there, like you can kind of guess which one's going to grow quicker and recover more quickly, it's going to be the one on the left, right? So um, it, it does, it is advantageous, advantageous to do that. With, so you've gone ahead and, and, and well, we've, we've spoken about, you know, pasture management and incorporating some BMPs to really make this all come together. Well, you, you know, you're going to probably want to implement a rotational grazing um, program on your facility. And that's where it comes into management. And if you're willing to take those steps for, for extra improved management on your, on your site, this is something we, we really recommend doing. Um, you know, for instance, if you, this is your, your field, you one of, one of several fields that you've renovated, this is 20% of what you have here, so to speak. So it's, it's growing, it's coming on. You want to go ahead and break that up with cross fencing. And then you just, you know, you have your paddocks one through six. Um, the idea here is you have a holding area as well. This is kind of your sacrifice area. 
uh, this area you sacrifice uh, to help promote grass growth and the rest of it. And if you allow your, your livestock in the paddock one, you wanna let them graze everything down to about an average of three inches and then pull them off and move them into paddock two. And what you want to do then is to come back in here and clip everything down to an even height, no less than three inches, and then run your pasture harrow around. It distributes the, the road apples, et cetera, gets that nutrients out there more, more evenly, um, and let it recover and repeat all the way through. You know, during this, this will work. Uh, really well and, and much faster in the spring and probably in the fall than it would in July and August. A lot of times people will get all the way around here with their livestock and they're like, okay, I need to go back into number one, but number one's really dry and it's not ready for it. So you're gonna have to put them in the holding area and let those areas recover um, or else you're gonna end up with the same situation that you were in today, so. Um, moving on, this is a, you know, kind of a wagon wheel type approach. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can set up your rotational grazing on your facility. Uh, it's, uh, it's not rocket science by any means. So I thought this was kind of funny uh, in terms of mowing after you're grazing. These guys are pretty ingenious. I think they're actually mowing a lawn, but I thought it was kind of funny. So. So going back to this uh, picture that we saw earlier in the presentation, this horse on this lush pasture. Well, this was the pasture before, and this is one of our cooperators. This is actually actually an employee that used to work at the district, but her field was, you know, it was it was grazed year round, and he had bare areas and so forth, and he had weeds coming on. It just was in tough shape, so. What she did is she went in there with pasture harrow and she worked it up or harrowed her field several times and she overseeded heavy with, uh, I'm not sure what she actually planted, but her her pasture mix here, here. And a year later or so, this is what she ended up with. And she had to put in cross fencing and, and incorporate a rotational grazing program. And it just made such a difference for her and her animals. And so yeah, so that's a, that's a nice success story there. It can be done. And it didn't happen with complete renovation either. So she chose to take the approach of, you know, some minimal renovation, so to speak. So this is another example. This is a coworker of ours um, at her place and her horses. Um, a few weeds there, but that's okay. We won't dare too much for that. And that's that's it. That's that's my talk today. And it's over. I'm not sure what time it is, but we're I think we have time for some questions still. Yeah, we're doing well. So there was a question, and I moss is one of those things that's not quite a weed, but it can be a pain. Um, and yeah. I, I have it at my house where it's more shady or wet or moist or something like that. But is there anything you can do when it gets into your grasses? Yeah, you sure can. So moss, you know, funny enough, moss likes an acidic soil and it likes it really likes wet acidic soil. And by lime, applying lime and, and through lime applications, well, you can get rid of moss that way. It takes a little bit of time. You could go the route of um, adding a little iron, you know, some, some moss killer, but be careful if that's going to be compatible with your livestock or not. Um, just be careful of that. And as with lime as well. Um, just make sure you know what you're putting down and that it's going to, you know, how much time you may need between applications and grazing um, uh, before, before you put your uh, livestock back out there. So, yeah. Uh, a couple more questions and some good jobs, Eric. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, is Lyme hazardous for human or livestock health? Yeah. So there's, I, I don't have that at the tip of my tongue, but there, there's some lime that can cause muzzle burn for, for your livestock. So um, you need to research that. I, I apologize. I don't have that information in front of me, but I know that there's some difference there. It may be that regular egg lime, flower lime is not caustic at all, but that may be one of the others is. So I'll, I'm sorry about that, but you're just going to have to ask and find out. That's right. Another question, and I deal with this myself, but any ideas on removing blackberry bushes? Well, 
if you don't blackberry bushes you know you can you can approach it using chemical herbicides um you can mow them down and repeated mowing i think is going to work really well i think that herbicides alone are not going to take care of blackberries i know i know some people will actually bring in some goats and goats will will chew the newer shoots but they won't get all of the plant so it just repeated mowing flipping, uh, sort of thing is really going to work best for, for blackberry yeah, I um, those roots of blackberries are are huge. Let me just say that. <laughs> um, so here I'm seeing a mix of questions. So let's see. So from Jen, uh, she says our horses have killed everything in our field and have left us mud and exposed dirt. Uh, would mm -hmm. you recommend tilling it up and planting, or do you think um, that they need to put down something to kill the few little spots that are left? Well, based on that description, I'd say you probably don't need to. To put anything down to kill the last remaining spots. Um, I think that one thing moving forward is that now is a great time to plan um, for the other practices that you really need to make that situation successful. You know, if you don't already have, probably have a shelter for them, but if you don't have like a, like a heavy use area off that shelter for them to go, um, yeah, then you're, you're going to be really fighting you know, that mud and barrier is moving forward. Um, but yeah, but it, but in terms of reseeding, sounds like that uh, come spring when things dry out, you're probably gonna have to work things up pretty good to break up that compacted layer. And I, I'll just remind everybody, Eric's contact information is on the screen. And if you're in Snohomish Conservation District or Snohomish County or Camino, he can come out and take a look, um, or you can contact your conservation district where you are too. So they can take a look at your field and, and give you some recommendations of what to do. Okay, more questions. Um, so how long do you typically wait to allow livestock to graze after applying lime? I think that Typically, if you're applying, um, you know, you get your lime out there, it's a flower lime, so to speak, and you can see it all over your leaf area. Wait for a couple of rainstorms to go through and wash it in. And if you don't see any more on your on your leaves, um, I would say that it's safe to go out there and 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 graze. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, super helpful. Uh, has given me hope for my pasture. Says. Yeah. Super. Um, then how many acres do you need for two to four sheep uh, to do this method of grazing? Uh, they have three acres. Is that enough? I would say that's that's most likely enough for two to, how many sheep? Two to three sheep? Two to four sheep. On three acres? Three acres, yeah. I'd say, you know, an acre per sheep should be plenty. Yeah, it should work out well. And assuming you're not on a rock pile or anything like that, um, if you're on a good, you know, you know, soil that's going to grow grass relatively well. It should be should be fine. Okay, thank you. And then, is there a cost-effective source for dolomite lime? Well, you would um, first look, do a soil test, and see if you're low on magnesium, and then and then make the decision of what kind of lime that you would want to buy. And there's also you know, you can do it yourself. If you have a small acreage, you know, by all means, do it yourself. There's also Northwest Lime, I believe, out of Skagit County. They have um, smaller commercial equipment that can get into smaller acres, like five acres, 10 acres, and so forth, and apply lime as needed. Um, or if you buy it yourself and you're looking for a good source for lime, you just kind of have to check with, um, you know, like Skagit Farmer Supply, maybe the Arlington Co-op. Wolf Kill Monroe, they sell lime as well. So those are some of your options out there for lime. Thank you. And I'll put a link to our Know Your Soils booklet. It's um, It has the basics of all of this stuff. Um, let's see. So another question from, let's see, we are developing our property and putting in pasture for goats. Goats aren't coming until next year. Um, guessing that our first step is brush hogging all areas that we want to pasture. Uh, could be. It depends on what's growing there now. Do they? Is there? A, There's a if, it, if it's tall, tall, brambly kind of wild stuff growing out there, then yeah, you, you'll probably want to brush hog everything and get it down to a manageable level. Yeah. Yeah, I can actually probably. There's. 
there's a photo in the chat I will uh, share in a second let's see and then another question while I do that um how do you think or what do you think um, about using hooved animals densely for a short period to break up soil for reseeding? Uh, so in terms of like flash grazing and so forth, that can be really effective in um, going in and managing a new seeding. And uh, uh, yeah, so that can, those animals would get in there and if the, if the grass plants are taller and they've gone to seed, then that hoof action of those animals will help to, you know, one, knock the seed out of the seed heads and so forth, and, and maybe trample it down and get it down um, next to the soil, soil surface where it needs to be. So, it could, yeah, it can, I've heard of it working. Yeah. yeah. And there's the picture from um, the property asking about the brush hogging. Yeah, that looks like a lot of reed canary grass, maybe. And, um, it, it's just gonna, yeah, you'd have to, you know, try mowing that down here this spring. Um, and that'll help generate new growth and so forth. And you'll know, just probably have to stay on top of it in terms of, uh, you know, not letting it get too tall for the mallet that you have. Were they, they're gonna bring goats in there? Uh, yes. Yeah. If that's the entire area, that's a lot of area for, for goats, I would say. Yeah. Then let's see from Lori, what if you have horses who can't be together? Well, um, you're going to have to figure out how to add fencing areas for them to not be able to co-mingle. I mean, if they can't be together, it's just going to, whatever kind of fence it's going to be needed and, and take to keep them separated. I don't know how, <laughs> I don't know how else to describe that. Um, yeah, sorry, I have a better answer for you, but that's something maybe Michael could yeah. help with a better than I could. Yeah. And again, save the chat. I put in Michael's contact information. Um, and a comment from Jennifer: Goats don't need pasture. Goats like brush. Yeah, they, they're more of like a browser, though, so to speak, too. Yeah. Yeah, and thanks for the presentation. Um, any other questions? And feel free if you want to unmute and ask Eric a question too. That's great. So who is the Michael that knows about where there's wild horses? Michael Hip is um, our uh, program he manager may, for this yeah. horse keeping program at our district. Oh, horse keeping program, you call it? Yeah. I will well, put yeah. He, he may know. I'm not, we don't want to say that he does know, but he, yeah. he may. <laughs> well, um, it's a lot closer than Nevada. Yeah. Looking to share some range with um, horses. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. You bet. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, and I put a link to our horse keeping page in the um, chat in as the well. Chat. And Michael did a presentation earlier today, and so I'm sure when the resources are sent out to everybody, his presentation will be in that mix. Oh, thank you so much, Car. Yeah, you're welcome. Mm, bye. Bye. Thanks. And then more just thank yous. Um, Great job, Eric. Super helpful. Well done. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Any more questions from everybody? Or are we all zoomed out and it's time to do something else? <laughs> yeah, I've got to turn the heat up on my Traeger. That chicken's getting too smoky out there. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'll stop the recording. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks, WSU, for hosting us and have a wonderful rest of the year until we see you in person next year at the high school. Looking forward to it. Oh, what does that say, Joanna? Jovana? I'll have to make you bigger. Hold on. <laughs> oh, I love the far side. Come on, come on. It's either something one or well, the other. There you uh, go. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Eric. All right. Have a good evening, you guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Yep.